Okay, everyone, thanks for joining um, the Platform API team show and tell. Um, we have so much to tell you from the last two weeks, which is impressive given people have been off on holiday and college and everything else that's, that's going on. Um, I'll hand over to Rashmi to give you a, a quick reminder of what we've been up to the last uh, couple of sprints before getting on to what we've just uh, finished. Thank you, Darren. Um, so last couple of weeks, we'll be, we've been talking about the Mosaic API, Academy API. We also spoke about data migration services, what we've been running on the Mosaic and Academy so that we can get the data out from the, these two data uh, data sets. Uh, we've been also talking about authentication. We started with Bastion and we have some more news to talk about. Then we also spoke about um, vulnerable people and the roadmap. So in in total, we have been doing a lot of things around in, in Platform API, which I'm sure we'll be covering up more. So next, I so what have we done so far? Um, I think I'll be happy go to Emma now to talk about the Mosaic work. Hi, yeah, so um, we finished the first iteration of the Mosaic API these couple weeks, um, and that consists of two endpoints, um, which will let us just retrieve data about resident information. So the first one's um, a list results, so you can query uh, residents by first name, last name, uh, address, and postcode. It will also return it in pages, which you can specify. So uh, maybe it will give you like 20 results, and then you can call it again to get like the next page so it doesn't return too much stuff. And then the second endpoint is just to get by ID. So it will just return one uh, residence information based on the ID that you get, give it, which would be like the mosaic ID. And then, yeah, hopefully these two uh, endpoints will make it a lot easier for other services to get uh, information out of Mosaic like more consistently as well. Um, I think it's Humara now of Academy. Yeah, so with um, Academy, we did a contact information for benefit claimants. It was a very similar process to the Mosaic API. So we did two get endpoints for um, a list record and for the view um, I get by ID. Um, one of the tricky um, things which we found was because there was an underlining data source um, and a resident can exist as more than one person, we felt as though that was quite different to most of our other databases. So we, um, we've done a one-off import for our mirror and we're going to do a spike overnight and see what the results are. Um, I think the next one is Marilla. Hello, everyone. Yes, one of our other main goals was vulnerability data. We wanted to know more about vulnerable residents, what vulnerability data defines them as vulnerable so we can offer targeted support during the pandemic. We knew that our data and insight colleagues have already done some excellent work where they produce reports in click, where they use multiple data sources, they have set given factors that would define a given household as vulnerable, and the data is the data sets are there. But one of the issues is that click is hosted on premises, which means the data is not easily available for other services to use. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to find a better way of reusing that great work and exposing it to services. Um, what we decided is that we need to find a way to take this data out of click and put it into our AWS environments where we can build APIs around it. So we ended up spending a day where uh, alongside Dara, we did a spike of extracting that click information using a click connector and loading it into an S3 bucket. Having the data in S3 bucket, our team decided to introduce the concept of a data pipeline. A data pipeline is essentially an automated process where when you load data into one data source, it needs to be able to pick up that data and load it into another one in an automatic way. So a bit more technical details of how the whole flow work. We have produced already a proof of concept. It does work, it's successful. And when Click loads that data using the Click Connector into an S3 bucket, for as long as the file is of type CSV, this triggers an S3 event notification, which will then call a Lambda function. The Lambda function picks up the data from the CSV file and loads it automatically into a Postgres instance. So we can do that. This is great. And we have come up with several next steps. So yesterday, we had a very productive meeting with Rajmi, Dara, and Lisa, where we discussed click data and possible uh, use cases we can have with it. 
we decided our next focus is single views vulnerability data needs. So the next steps our team is going to take is define the requirements for that vulnerability data, deciding what data we need, um, say deploying a data pipeline around it so we can automate that process and building an API so we can expose the data to the single view um, service. We have, however, also um, identified several challenges we know we are going to encounter. One of them is that in click the vulnerability data reports, the main identifier is a UPRN, while housing data in new age, the main property identifier is prop reference. So we need to find a way to join the data. And we also know that the current reports are, because UPRN being one of the identifiers, are based on household level rather than individual level. So in the future, if you want to have vulnerability data per individual, we'll need to look into that and do some further work on it. And now I pass over to my colleagues, which who will speak more about Bastion House and improving it. I think that's me. Um, OK, so first off, Bastion Host, it's, um, what, it, what is it? It's, it's a way of providing a single point where you can jump into your AWS network. So if you've got a database within the AWS environment, you don't want to make that available out um, in the public. You've got that one point of entry into your, um, into your account. Um, historically, and AWS's uh, documentation kind of backs this up, it would be a machine which sits inside a public subnet, and all that means is that it's available over the internet. Let's see, it will have an address that's available over the internet. It's not available to everyone because it would be locked down in certain ways. It would be locked down using um, a single public and private key, and there would be a single user on that machine. Um, now, both of those would be shared between all of the individuals that need to access it, whether that's me, Morella, Cell, and anyone, or any of our own agencies that work with us. We'd all have exactly the same keys and the same user, which we can all agree isn't great. Um, you could further lock it down by um, uh, locking it down by access to a client IP address. So on some of these that we've got, like my home IP is on there, so I can actually jump onto it. Um, and you could go further than that by locking it down, by creating different users and um, spending time configuring a moderately complex service, which would allow you to use multi-factor authentication whenever you logged on to the Bastion host. Um, Morella did some investigation into that, and it seemed really it quite overly complex. Um, you know, we have this idea, keep it simple, stupid. You know, so we, we tried to look for a more simpler, uh, simpler thing. Um, and Morella found this... Uh, thing called AWS Session Manager, which um, uh, AWS provide. And it provides quite a few benefits over the previous setup. Um, ben and Emma on the team did some investigations on how we'd want to use it. And um, what it provides us with is it uses the existing credentials that we use to access AWS. So when we go try and go into the, the dashboard of AWS, it uses those existing credentials, username and password that we have, which is great. You've now got individuals going onto machines rather than using one account. Um, there's also some built-in login into um, AWS Session Manager, so it actually keeps track of who's logging in and what sessions are happening. Um, it's a little bit limited, but there are ways of extending that to provide much more comprehensive kind of audit trail about who's been logging in and accessing what. Um, it still provides the ability to attach a client. So by client, I mean like a database client, um, uh, SQL Plus, or uh, I use like PG Admin. You can actually use that on your local machine, hop onto the Bastion host still using this AWS Session Manager, and then through to your um, uh, to your maybe your Postgres instance that's sitting nicely secured inside AWS. Um, and the, the biggest thing with this actually was we could now move that machine into a private subnet, so it no longer had um, a visible um, internet address, which adds that extra level of security. Um, so what that means actually as well, when someone leaves, we disable their AWS account and they've no longer got access to the Bastion, whereas previously they would have had the key and known to use the user, and they would have known the address of the machine. Um, so that gives us that extra bit of security. Um, now, the multi-factor authentication piece on here, um, it's already built into um, the single sign-on that we use to get into AWS. Um, so again, at the moment, we just use username and password, but you can switch on multi-factor authentication and use maybe your Google Authenticator or whatever else you want to use to log in. And because we're using Session Manager, that all kind of stacks up quite nicely. Now, so yesterday I switched on MFA, multi-factor authentication, for that single sign-on parts of AWS. Works quite nicely, but there are little quirks around the process that we kind of need to iron out and that I'm, I'm documenting. But essentially, it looks good, and it's a simpler process and much more secure. And that's it. I think I hand over to Rashmi, I imagine. I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, the end, uh, we always had in our mind that we have to work on a roadmap 
for three reasons. Uh, obviously, we need to have a strong use case for all our APIs that we'll be generating. It's immediate needs and have a clear vision which will help us to manage our backlog well, to be honest. So we were very clear about the fact that we don't want to create APIs on the fly or with, with something that doesn't have any use cases or needs, to be honest, that strongly believe that we, we are following. Hence, we came up with the first draft of the roadmap and possible services who will be consuming our platform APIs and types, to be honest. Um, so for example, we, we know that there's a strong need from the single view in terms of linking records, having a central contact data, auditability needs, which currently the single view is struggling with. Um, and also, for example, the other example is NCT in terms of linking via UPR and cautionary alerts and so on. So we know these are then there are many other services. So be it in manager arrears or manager repairs, uh, repairs, uh, repairs hub, so on. So we know there's a lot of need for our platform API that can be used in future um, future pro, uh, services uh, service development. With respect to this roadmap, uh, I've, I've also arranged a discussion with BRM this afternoon to ensure that we have not missed any possible use cases, which is in our future pipeline, and just gives us a strong need for a, a platform APIs to be more to be more in use. And these guys will be aware. That, okay, this API is there. Probably we should be uh, incorporating in our project or services that will be coming up. So that's pretty much a good exercise. And yeah. So if you see in the diagram, there's a lot of breakdown and for consuming services and use cases and relevant APIs that we have come up with. So it gives us a fuller idea about what we are planning to do and working on. So yeah, that's from me and thank you. That's the end of the slide looks like, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. It is. Um, so what questions have, has anyone got for us? We will of course share the, um, the roadmap. Um, we think it's in a in a place now where we can share it, and I'll put a link in G plus when we share this video later. But any questions from anyone? I have a question. Sorry, I can't. I'm I'm sorry. It's pro you're probably saying things that are in there, but I can't. Um, I can't really see the Charlie board. Could you just explain a bit more? So I think what you're saying is the first use case for. What I think we're still calling resident contact information is going to be single view. Is that right? Mm, yeah. But so are we are we talking there about really core information, or are we talking about because you just kind of were mentioning quite a lot there and things like cautionary contacts? Yeah. Do we know yet what's reusable and what's not, and how much should be in a core platform API versus in service APIs? So what we have identified in um, uh, use cases and the possible one is the uh, around Mosaic API Academy and around UH. So those are the things they're already doing it. However, there's a need for auditability. So if there's any changes, any tracking that's happening or anything that's updating or linking these records, there's, there's no bad backbone around it so the, those are the ones we'll be working going forward and also there's need for vulnerability data as well which kind of not being covered completely so we'll be working around those one as i said in, and uh, in in the in the, uh, in, the uh, in the slide that we'll be working towards and and sorry just so so potentially it could be a resident contact information api and yeah. a vulnerability api are you thinking about creating new data sources I presume that we're not talking about writing back from applications into all of all of those systems where you've created individual APIs. Will you create some kind of intermediary data source? So the intermediate data source is the one which we have already built in Postgres. So we'll be writing back, but also we'll be working towards how we can uh, update the, uh, the source one, the source data sources. For example, if any information that needs to be updated in UH, we'll need to be updating that Postgres instance and also the into the UH as well. So we'll be working out towards that as well. Okay. Any other questions from, from anyone? I'm conscious we've gone through quite a lot um, in the presentation and uh, some speed. Um, but uh, please uh, uh, don't hold back with any more questions. Everyone's very quiet, so I can only assume that you're all stunned and pleased with what we're doing. Any questions with regards to the data pipeline that's been introduced in this project? Or is all clear? Sounds like we must have answered all possible questions. Um, but 
as ever, if anybody thinks of something afterwards, please don't hesitate to contact one of us. Are there, sorry, I have a ton of questions, sorry, because I'm <laughs> really interested and in, I probably just don't have enough of the detail. Is there a way like to, to get involved so we can ask those questions and have more kind of detailed conversations about it without asking really intricate things now that would probably make everyone else really bored? Yeah, yeah. So we're already in conversation with few people from your team list. Um, Lisa and Daro already on board. So anything with regards to vulnerability, we are making sure that we are covering up all the cushion. And obviously, I can see Tom has the similar kind of cushion. Looks like. Um, so yeah. Uh, so yeah, so we will be very pleased if you guys can come up and if you think that we have not covered the use cases or there's a strong need, please feel free to tell us about it and we would like to incorporate into this project. That's, uh, it just makes our needs more stronger, to be honest. I imagine quite a few questions might arise when the Trello board with the roadmap on it is shared. Sorry, I want to put it into the chat except I'm trying to juggle three different tabs and my computer's running quite slow. Uh, so I, I will share it as um, you know, within a few minutes of ending the, the call. Um, in terms of, sorry, Tom, I'm just reading your question. Um, how, what, what, is it okay if we can open up the Slack or you guys can uh, contact us, any one of us, uh, if you have some question that you would like us to answer? I'm looking at Tom, Lindsay and Liz. Or anybody else who wants to ask us straight away? Yes. Is there is there a right way to join the Slack channel? Um, is that is that LinkedIn as well? Or... Yeah, we could add add you up. Or do you want us to create a separate uh, Slack channel where you can ask all the questions to us? We could probably create a, a separate one because then we have one then for team chatter that doesn't distract other people, and then we can have one purely on sort of like API questions and, and stuff. I think that would be a very good idea. Yeah. I think that would be really helpful. It's most of my questions are not kind of on the technical architecture stuff, which it seems like you guys are like flying with. It's much more about, um, yeah, how, how do we make sure it's reusable? How do we make sure that we're not perpetuating the same problems, like in terms of creating different data sources? And I guess there's maybe from your point of view, Tom, there's something about um, just how we reuse appropriately. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Appropriately. I, think, I think exactly the same as you said, Liz, at the, at the beginning of that. That. Um, I think I'm still I'm still trying to get my head around the context of the work rather than the technical approach, if that makes sense. Definitely, and definitely. I think the Trello board will help a great deal with that, so I'll make sure yeah. I have a good review of that, and then we can. Um, yeah, brilliant. Sure, yeah. sure. Um, it's and it's going to be subjected to changes that once I have uh, we have a meeting with the BRMs as well, so making sure everybody's on in the loop for that. And also, we have to have discussion about the retention policy, which you have mentioned quite a few times, Tom, in the past. So we need to make sure that even that's in <laughs> I'll corporate keep, somewhere. I'll keep, I'll keep banging on about that. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Most welcome. Tom. Yeah. I'll, I mean, as a roadmap, I describe it as it's, it's not a, a roadmap, it's a sat nav. So it, it will change as we learn more. Um, but definitely I'll create an, an API discussion channel in Slack and I'll, and I'll, I'll invite uh, you, Tom and Liz and Lindsay to it to get started. Um, so no question too small, no question to anything, really. All questions welcomed. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments or, um, or shall we draw a line there and take it up on Slack? I think we'll, uh, I'll take your silence as agreement. Uh, so have a great day, everyone. Thank you very much for making the time to join us today. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.